So hopefully we're recording and would like to say hello to my friend Adrian McMurchie, who also happens to be known as the Glasgow Illustrator. Hello, Adrian. Hi, Sandy. How are you? I'm fine. Um, we've got beautiful work of yours coming up. And Good. I'm just I'm very interested to start with this one because it's not what I would think of automatically when I think of your work. But nonetheless, it is very much about the city of Glasgow um, mm -hmm. and you using your skill to fit the entirety of something into a small space. Could you tell us a little bit about this particular piece of work? Well, I'm known as an illustrator um, architecturally, but I did originally study graphic design. So there's always been an element of typography in what I do. Um, the, the basis of this map, it, it was born out of, you'll see there's some buildings in it. It's born out of the fact that I'd drawn so many buildings in Glasgow, I thought I could probably make a map, the boundaries of the, the city of Glasgow, with all the illustrations that I've done. So I started doing that and then I realised quite quickly that I'd not, never painted anything in Rock Hill or Crookston or done Toker. So I thought, wait a minute. So I just started dropping in lettering words and that's how it came about. Uh, it's the only, I, I've done loads of maps like this, but apart from maybe one or two, it's the only one that's got architectural drawings of mine in it. The rest of them are just purely uh, word maps. Yeah. People, people are always, people occasionally pulling me up for the fact that they're saying, well, Furhill was not quite as close to such and such as that, but it's not meant to be a, a tourist map, <laughs> you know. You are, you are bringing this... attention, aren't you? You're bringing attention to things, you're kind of suggesting there that things are overlooked within certain, you know, certain pockets of the city are just kind of left oh. off tourist maps. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when, I, when I'm out and about, I mean, that map we just looked at there, there's actually a number of areas that are still not on it. There's lots of small areas within, like for example, if you talk about Rutherglen, there's lots of small areas within Rutherglen, Fernhill and whatnot. So I need to go back and I'm constantly updating the Glasgow map. With the Scotland one, I'll come to the, the map at the top in a second, but with the Scotland one, likes of the whiskey and the golf ones we do, you cannot include everything obviously because it would just be minuscule type. So it's it, it, there's no, particular rhyme and reason to the places I've picked out but obviously you're picking out the big hitters like Glasgow and Edinburgh and Aberdeen etc and then a further up north you get some pretty silly name places so it's worth putting them in as well. Um, <laughs> if anyone lives um, in the north of Scotland please don't be offended by this particular <laughs> segment of the interview. Well, well to be fair the people living up there didn't name them that but uh, they are pretty humorous some of them but um, well, down south as well let's, let's just include the dotted around Scotland then, not up north. Um, the map above, the reasonably accurate map of Glasgow, the reason it's titled that is because previously, as I was saying a second ago about the, the Glasgow word map, people would pull me up. So that gets see yeah, away with murder because folk will say, well, that road's not as close to that. That's not as wide as it's just direct into the Really? Do you have super. people saying that to you? Yeah, not so much now, but... Um, when I first did the Glasgow word map and that put out in social media and whatnot, there was quite a lot of folk going, oh, that's no, that's no there and that's no there. It's like, <laughs> yeah. So, but, you know, the, people like to have an opinion. But um, so the, the reason we actually map of Glasgow, um, it's a similar sort of uh, idea as, the, uh, as the, the word map. There's lots of buildings I've drawn in Glasgow. I've drawn probably a lot more than that now. But I love the old maps, the old Ponce maps. When you take me back to like, you know, 14th, 13th, 12th century, you go back uh, in to just um, Reformation even, if you go back as far as that, the actual mapping of the city is pretty accurate. But as you can see, it's quite basic and naive in certain senses as well. So that's what I loved about those maps. And with this, um, where there were spaces where I couldn't put in buildings, I just start writing in some text. Now, some of the text is factual and some of it's uh, my ramblings of maybe I was at this area and this happened to me then and some of it's just nonsense. But with these maps and like with the Urwelly, I'm not sure a lot of people will know what the Urwelly is here, but Urwelly is a famous Scottish um, cartoon in, in, in the, one of the national newspapers. And that's a model of Urwelly. Um, there was about, I think it was about 60 different artists in Scotland were given one of these casts 
they were asked to create a piece of artwork on it. And so I wanted to create an erasable accurate map of Glasgow. Everyone called them something around our really. The, the vast majority, majority of people, but I kind of wanted to get away from that and just put my own artwork, wrap it around the, the model. Um, it, it's probably the most physically demanding piece I've ever done because there's all sorts of wee nooks and crannies and I was using Posca pens to do this with. So in his mouth, you have to hold the, the end of the pen and try, and try and write. And then you have to get under his knee and stuff. So it's, it's quite tiring and it took forever, but it was a, it was a lovely, oh, you lovely piece of work. I was a really tired man, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you just a little bit more about the, the, the figures though? These were then you know, all the different artists in, in Scotland were asked to participate. You were chosen, you did the work. Then what happened to them? They were all auctioned off last year in the Kelvin Grove Art Galleries. It was a great night. Um, mm -hmm. And we actually won ours back because um, I've done some work with the Prince and Princess of Wales Hospice and they've got a new lovely well, it's a kind of strange thing to call a hospice lovely but it is it's a, a beautiful hospice just over in Bell Houston Park mm. and I've done work for them in the past quite a lot of work and they're great people to work with and uh, they raise thousands and millions of pounds so I thought it'd be nice to win ours back um, and, and donate it to them it's, it's actually kind of my dad that won it back because my dad passed away a few years of pancreatic cancer so we basically used his some of his money to buy this and it will go in the grounds of uh, Prince and Princess of Wales Hospice and hopefully give a bit of interest and joy to people because there's a lot to read on it. Again, a lot of factual stuff. When I do all, any of these maps, I learn so much about the city and you know, I, I love Glasgow. Yeah. But I'm always learning. And so the things I learned doing this map, it was incredible. But again, there's, there's loads of, once I start drawing and once I get into a sort of rhythm, um, your mind just wanders and you start writing nonsense, but it's it's enjoyable nonsense. And then it'll come back around to a bit of factual things. So that that's the story behind the Willie. Really. Um, and once the gardens in the Prince and Princess Wales Hospice uh, get done up, that will sit uh, just the entrance. So I'm looking forward to I, that. I think in your work, what's lovely is that you do return quite a lot to kind of charity and thinking about mm -hmm. I mean, Glasgow specifically, like the caring city. You know, yeah. to go to Glasgow, you're never going to be alone. You're never going to, or these kind of feelings that a lot of people have about Glasgow. It's, yeah. Uh, you know, you give back into your city. You give back. Adrian McMurtry gives back to the city. I mean, I, I love this. You know, this is one of your, what I think of as instantly recognisable illustrations of GOMA in the Gallery of Modern Art uh, in Royal Exchange Square in the middle of Glasgow. But then the thing that's next to it is the drawing you did for the Christmas card campaign. Um, yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the, the dot to dot one was, um, I did that a few years ago, the original dot to dot, and obviously had a cone on its head. So um, I always wanted to do a dot to dot. I've got a 10 year old, nearly 11 year old daughter. So I've always loved dot to dots myself. She's always loved them and I've always wanted to do a kind of piece of artwork based around the dot to dot. So I thought it was quite an obvious choice to do uh, Duke of Wellington and his, his horse. Um, and it worked out really well. I was really pleased with it. Yeah. Um, normally, I mean, down the bottom on the plinth bit, it usually says welcome to Glasgow in the actual print. Now, Glasgow Caring City, they approached me to do some Christmas cards. And it was basically to, um, the money raised from these Christmas cards would help 13 to 19 year olds young adults, because quite often they're overlooked that age group, it's quite often as older people or very young people, they, they get the charity donations in, in whatever shape or form. So it was interesting to me when they would explain to me, this is where it's going 13 to 19. And I didn't even think for some reason, I, I didn't really think of people that age, you know, being, being destitute or, or, or in need. So more than happy. So it, was, it had to appeal to some, to people of that kind of age. So I thought it was quirky enough. It's an obvious landmark in Glasgow, and I thought it would resonate with people. Mm. And obviously, with the red and white cone originally on his head, that's worldwide known now, mm. around Christmas time, I thought it made sense just to pop on a Christmas hat. So it still sort of sits in the same yeah, design. For people who are not familiar with this, I mean, 
the, the landmark actually isn't the gallery. <laughs> the landmark is the statue and it's not the yeah. statue. It's the fact that he gets the cone put on his head. All of, you yeah. know, it, it's become just such a feature, hasn't it? And again, I'm sure there are people come to Glasgow and that's actually the cone on the head is part of their tourist like itinerary to go and see it. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, I think it's it's quickly gone up to top ten over the last 10, 15 years. It, I mean, it's I mean, there was talk of the city council lifting it up again so people can get up that high. I mean, if you've 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 obviously stood there, it's it's high up, you know. And I've never seen anyone put it on. I've got a feeling the city council are putting it on every night at three in the morning. <laughs> Come on now, Adrian, you've been out there, you've done it. I know you have. You've been up on that plinth. I would have done it back in the day. I used to, I used to to be fair, I used to chop draw in front of the uh, Gallery Modern Art. And do um, I used to do pictures of cuddly animals, and my pal Michael would do classic masters, you know, and my other friend would do rock stars. So there was something for everyone. But um, I definitely have given it a go. But nah, no, no. <laughs> this is generosity again. Something for everyone, even with your chalk drawings on the pavement in Royal Exchange Square. Um, well, yeah. You know, it's always for me when I look at your work. Obviously, we've known each other for a long time, and I feel really mm -hmm. glad that that that's been the case. But also more that I can talk to you, but I can also look at your drawings and where sometimes I feel a bit homesick or a bit lost in being far away from family. For example, it's amazing how a building doesn't make up for a, a hug you'd get from your dad or your mum or something, but it does take you right back to somewhere that's very mm -hmm. important. These overviews you do of Glasgow, you live in Glasgow. And yeah. how important are the drawings for you to keep connected to your city? Uh, yeah, hugely. Um, I mean, I, I cycle a lot. Now, back in my twenties, I cycled loads and I stopped and I'm doing it again. Um, and particularly now in lockdown, you see so much of the city. Um, I mean, that's just a handful of buildings. But Glasgow is known as one of the best Victorian cities in the world, along with Chicago, Melbourne, um, and Manchester, and previously Birmingham as well. Birmingham, Birmingham is beautiful, but anyway, that's another story. So, uh, but to show the wide variety of architecture, and that's why a lot of people go to Edinburgh and go to a beautiful city. And yes, it is a beautiful city, but there's a, a lot more variety of architecture I find in Glasgow. Um, and again, I'm always looking up and I'm always uh, finding new new buildings to paint. People still come to me. I think I've painted everything in Glasgow. Not everything, but everything's fairly well known. But people always say, have you painted this and that? And I go, no, I haven't. I need to do that, you know? So there's such a variety of beautiful builds. Um, in, in these this this kind of thing, I've done these quite often for um, you know design companies for vinyls for walls, and it's quite interesting because it's um you want to get the balance right. Um, it's, it's kind of like a jigsaw. You've got all the buildings together, so I'll throw them together on Photoshop. I've painted them all, drawn them. I'll cut them out, put them all into Photoshop, and mess it about with that for a couple of days until I get the right balance. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's what you see here. The the this is a good example of uh, my technique because the sky is the only time I use watercolour in a traditional fashion with lots of water. The rest of the time, the buildings, um, there's a lot of paint, a lot of pigment paint. There's very little water, so it gives a real sort of solid structure to it. If you look at the Gallery of Modern Art and you're far yeah. left, my left anyway, you yeah. can see that's quite strong. It's not, it's, you know, it's not like the sky. It's quite see-through and translucent. It's quite a strong colour. And then within the windows, I use ink. So it's three different kind of, you know, to give okay, a sense why of why heat. Why do you windows with yellow? Well, it's just to give a sense of heat and light, basically, and uh, just a different depth. And it's basically, it's, it's ink. If I use paint, it doesn't give the same effect, but the, the ink really kind of stands out and kind of draws you in. I, I'd like to think a wee bit. So you get the ink, you get the, the traditional method of the sky, and you get the solid buildings I mean if you my buildings will start off in fact I think you might have an example coming up my buildings will start off as just a line drawing 
Mm. And that, if you see a building getting built, it's almost like that. It's almost a lattice structure. And then you, you build up the cladding and the brickwork or the stone or whatever. So that's how kind of do the process myself. I love that uh, the yellow you're saying is like about light and kind of warmth. Mm. Again, yeah. Glaswegians will know it's cold and damp and that, that weather, the weather element in Glasgow can be quite unforgiving, can't it? So when I look at your drawings, yeah. much as it's very much about transporting back to a central place, I don't ever feel freezing cold or maybe it is because of the sense of warmth I'm seeing in the buildings. And also I usually get the feeling that I want to be some some architectural illustrations you look at, they're academic. Mm -hmm. um, it's a study that's kind of passive. Whereas with your yeah. child, I always feel like they're, you know, I'm in it, I'm in amongst it. Right, yeah, I've, I've, a lot of people have said that, and I, I, that's really important for me to hear because I don't, I didn't, I don't think about it that way, but I probably should, and it's great to hear that because I look at loads of architectural renderings or drawings, and pretty much I love them all. I think they're great. I'm doing a piece of work just now for Clifford's Tower down in in York, and they're revamping the whole visitor experience, and they want panoramic views from the tower. And they've showed me the architects ones they've used before and i'm thinking they're great <laughs> but obviously there's a certain but do you not think that you breathe this. life into things by this way of working you know it's not just about the color i mean there is a line drawing of yours coming up but Aye. there's still a sense of if there's like a humanity in these that maybe isn't present in the more mechanical or yeah. academic drawings of Architectural space, or well, yeah, well, Quentin, Quentin Blake, the, the illustrator, he 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 said something that I thought, yeah, that's that's bang on. Because I used to, when I was doing the illustrations for the Sunday Herald Restaurant Review, I used to paint and draw in all the restaurants. Um, I started off doing it on layout paper, and then if I made any mistakes, I could change that when it was tracing up onto the watercolor paper, and it, it turned out great. It was lovely, and it was great to have these blueprints of the illustration anyway, but. After a while, I just went straight onto the watercolour paper and um, and that's what Quentin Blake was saying. He says, you lose something if you do a rough of certain drawings. Certainly has if you see them very, very loose and there's a lot of life to them. So you lose a wee bit if you're tracing up and straightening up and it just gets a wee bit uptight. So that, I think that might be one of the reasons too, because I'm very quick with my line work and my pencil I use is a, a really, really hard uh, six, six or seven H. Um, so you make a line, you're almost going to, you'd go through the water, you'd go through the layout paper with that kind of pencil because it's so hard, but it needs to be really kind of scratchy, scratchy, if you like. Yeah, um, but you know, when I think about that, like thinking about drawing with like a seven or six H pencil, that's like my idea of hell on earth because it's so unyielding, quite literally, isn't it? It's an unyielding uh, pencil, which is then funny because what you produce is so yielding, it's so giving. Uh, well, I talking a lot to people at the moment one I'm always so inspired and amazed how many artists I talk to who are kind of engaged in a wider philanthropy or a sense of charity or somehow not just making work that's about or for just them it's mm -hmm. something wider and you're part of that but I'm always also kind of amazed at how this idea again of generosity it's not just a generosity in that kind of philanthropic sense but it's also a sense of generosity of like sharing like sharing what you see sharing your city um about helping people feel a sense of belonging i'm not quite sure how that links to to using a 6h pencil because it seems so ungiving <laughs> to use yeah. that really really hard hard graphite but I would never ever guess that there was that hardness and your your drawings are always so soft and giving. Oh, thanks for saying that. It's, that's, that's nice to know. But the, the, yeah, the, the hard pencil is probably <laughs> helping the, the, the space within the drawing, if you, if you see what I mean, because you, you'll see the line work, but then if it was a thicker pencil, it would probably be a bit looser 
well, not looser, but it would be a bit kind of um, less focused, maybe, is probably the right word. Yeah, I mean, I was doing a thing with my, my daughter recently. They were doing artwork about um, perspective, and she was asking me what perspective is. <laughs> I, says, I says, I'm probably not the best person to ask because I've usually got about, in certain paintings, I've usually got about 15 different focal points, you know, vanishing points. So but she got she got the idea. She was better at it than I was, put it that way. <laughs> funny because when I've... Um... Lots of lots of people watching might know this, but Adrian and I have collaborated before with younger learners in some of my classes. And uh, with Matteo Pericoli, he was actually one of the first people I ever beamed into my classroom to actually meet my students. And it was funny because I was trying to teach my class about perspective and you just completely wrecked that. It was like a, a little <laughs> Scottish wrecking ball came in. He was like, no. <laughs> Well, that was, that's the great thing, because I've, I've gotten into classes, and I remember doing that with your, I did a couple of your classes, I think, Sandy, didn't I? It was great fun. It was That was way back, way before this Zoom business was going on. We were doing this in Skype, I think. But I've done it with a few classes physically going in, and it's usually primary ones to six. Um, and as, the, as they always say, you know, it's the, the naivety of, of the young mind. Um, often produces a great drawing and I'm always amazed that um, when I go in and show them my technique two minutes later they're all doing it to, to, to a boy and a girl um, in the class it's, it's, it's bang on you know they've got the, the, the right look it's just a wee bit wibbly wobbly and that's the way you should look at <laughs> certain life people say do you ever draw people it's like listen I draw if I, I drew I can draw people but I draw people like I draw buildings now, buildings are far, far more forgiving, but if I draw a face like that, that's, that's you know, you're not one on your wall, you know. <laughs> I also really love the idea that, you know, you're, you are taking, you're taking your family with you around the, the, the world and also then <laughs> drawing everything wherever you go. Yeah. Um, is that a part of you, like even on your family holidays, are you inseparable from a sketch pad? No, um, shame to say I'm not at all. I take my sketch pad every time we go away anywhere, whether it's London or, or further afield. Um, but I rarely bring it out of the suitcase, <laughs> funnily enough. I'll take a lot of photographs. To be fair, most of my work is drawn from, from photographs. There's not much difference in the sense that if I'll sit down and, and draw a building outside, you know, and just sit down and draw it, You'll get much the same drawing as you will in front of you just now, but the drawing you see in front of you just now, it will have more detail in it. Because if I go back to the Warmth and Launch studio and get a whole series of photographs and zoom in photographs, I'll be able to put a lot more detail to it. So, um, but um, yeah, no, I very, very um, occasionally do. I mean, I'll always take photographs from when I draw it because especially with buildings, whenever we go somewhere, it's... Where was it we went? We were somewhere a couple of years ago and it just didn't do anything for me because there was no sense of architecture, there was no sense of heritage in the place, you know, there was no kind of architectural style or anything. Um, so you go to London or you go to New York or you go to Lisbon, it's just wall to wall and the more detail the better in my opinion. But, uh, you know, I've been fortunate to be going, my wife used to work for British Airways so we, we'd fly abroad with her and she worked long haul, so we'd go to pretty exotic, interesting places. So I've got a bank of images to, to work my way through, and I will one day. <laughs> Do you think in terms of your, um, your, your commercial life as a selling artist, do you find it, uh, I mean, because you are known as the Glasgow illustrator, is your Glasgow work by far and away the most popular? Or do are people equally or more interested in your depictions of other places? Yeah, I think it'd probably sell mostly Glasgow pieces. There's probably more Glasgow pieces than anything else on my website that I've drawn or painted. But yeah, equally the, the European or the American or US rather, or, or further afield are as, well, not as popular, but I've done, done less work. But yeah, I send a lot of prints abroad, put it that way. You know, there's a lot of, I mean, there's probably a massive ex, expat community. There is, in fact, people tell me that when they buy prints, they say, oh, thanks, this is from our brother-in-law who used to live in Glasgow, that kind of thing, or, or whatever, I used to live in the States. So, um, 
yeah, over the last few years, I've sold a lot more just out with Glasgow. A lot of people still, not a lot of people, occasionally people still come to me and say, do you do anything other than Glasgow? Um, and this is before the Glasgow Illustrator moniker tagline. Um, and yeah, I, I always find that a kind of strange question to any artist. Would you paint anything that's not just where you're from? I understand it in the sense I, I don't like painting places I've not been. I will do. If someone says to me, I want a commission of this place in you know, India or whatever, and they've got a photograph, I'll do it. But I'd rather see the place myself. Yeah. And it's quite it's very interesting when I do a painting of somewhere I've not been and then I actually go. Uh, in fact, I did it of the Zootrope building in San Francisco. Yeah, I saw it. Um, and then I went, in fact, I've painted it since quite different. And I went with Donna and, and Grace, my daughter. And uh, it was weird. It's just weird because you, you just look at this photograph for how many hours and do it, and that's it done. And then, you, you know, when you look at something, you look at a photograph, it's lovely. But when you're actually there, you get this whole vista, you get everything that's around it. So I'm always fascinated by that. And probably quite boring as well. <laughs> no, I, well, you're using a word boring, and it's absolutely not the word I would ever choose because I think to look properly at somewhere, yeah, you know, you're paying such attention. There's a real uh, respect for a place, isn't there, when you when you mm -hmm. meticulously record it? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And it, yeah, because I'm looking at it. I suppose we see with portrait artists, there must be some sort of connection with the sitter because you're looking. So intimidately, intimidately, intimately rather, that the person, you, know, you, you build up a relationship. And I'm not saying I'll get a relationship with buildings, but you know what I mean? You're really going to get to know them well. And you'll see a repeat in certain buildings. I mean, you'll see it, it, buildings always repeat, and not always, but generally repeat. So the certain windows, for example, or, or, or structures or, or, or styles, Scottish styles or whatever, Flemish, that you recognise in the building. So it comes a bit of second nature to you because I've done this kind of building before, albeit it's a different design. If you weren't uh, an illustrator, what would you be? I'd uh, be doing something in the theatre. My mum and dad were always in the theatre. Mum's got a theatre company. So I always worked. Um, I did go on stage a couple of times, but uh, no. Um, so I loved working in the, the light box and the sound box. And it's, yeah, it's... it's I don't know, it's something there's quite not much magical. separation though, is there? If we look at your work and we think about it, that there's not much separation between you making these drawings of places and transporting mm. us there to somebody being transported to a stage set or yeah. I, I often think your work is like a stage set. You know, you could really imagine this like taken apart as a backdrop with you know, yeah, it's I, a yeah. method of like having separate drawings and layering them up together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I love the sound of it. I'd love to be involved in some... I mean, I've, I've painted sets in the past, but not my work. So it'd be lovely to see that in grand scale. Well, when I say it's not my work, I've done smaller pieces for my, my mum's theatre company. But yeah, to see something like grand scale in, in, in the, the, the backdrops would be terrific. But uh, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, there's something quite what's magical. The, what's the famous Glasgow play? Let's get this recorded and send it off to someone and say, here, this Adrian McMurchie, he's... Ready. I, well, <laughs> yeah, this, this, it's always, they're always hitting the right person, isn't it? That's that's the that's the key to, to a, bit of, a bit of luck and, and a bit of perseverance. That's the key to most things in, in, in business. So here we've got Ashton Lane. Yeah. You know this is coming, don't you? This sense that when we were speaking before, I was going through the slides and I was saying the kind of arc of what I'd hope to talk about. Which of course never ever goes to plan <laughs> because <laughs> we, we probably already talked about the things that I, I maybe would talk about with this but again th this is a really for me especially very familiar scene this is um ashton lane I, I like with your work again this idea of being very much somewhere that's alive and though there aren't any people you've got all the evidence that people are just about to suddenly burst forth from the Grosvenor yeah. or um, you know tumble out drunk from Ginty's or you know there'll be a brawl at Brel you know there's something kind of yeah. ha just about to That's fun it's funny people have never very rarely have they pick, picked up on that and even with the restaurant reviews I did if the building was pretty dull from the outside I'd do an illustration of the interior 
and you'd see tables with food and drink on them and there'd be no people. <laughs> I mean, I didn't mind John the odd person, but I think it was the editor, the head of process, can you leave the people out? So I generally don't have people in, in, in my, my images, my street scenes or, or whatever, vistas. And my mum said to me at the start of lockdown, she says, you know what you should do? We should photograph like Glasgow and then paint it as it is just now. And I says, well, to be fair, mum, that's pretty much what they look like anyway. <laughs> but, you know, I always think that somebody is there. I'm there. Uh, yeah, well, that's good. It kind of, I like the idea that it does draw you in. A lot of people mention that. It, the, the, again, back to the light, the orange in the window. I mean, you, know, you look in the window, any window, it's never that orange, but people accept that. And I think they, they buy into the kind of warmth of a place and, and being able to go inside. If um, I don't even get any examples here, but the, the, the restaurant review images, they worked on a level. I didn't realise until I was actually, I sat down and... I thought about my process because when you're looking in a window, you're looking in a restaurant window, you get a reflection. You tend not to be able to see inside. So what I do is I go right up to the, the window and photograph <laughs> inside. So when you see that, well, no, with permission, of course, you know, I, I always say to people. Anyone going to up. Glasgow, if you see a wee man outside the window, it's Adrian. <laughs> no, per permission is always granted. Well, most of the time. But... Um, <laughs> So you, you'll see from the illustration or the painting I do, you'll be able to see straight into the, the building. I think that helps with people you're drawn in because you can see inside as opposed to in reality, you get mostly of a, a, a reflection. Do you think um, you've ever drawn somewhere that you don't find interesting? I don't, uh, oh, yeah, a few commissions people have asked for. M more than that, like, do you ever... Sometimes I wonder with this, again, this is like the, the, the tourist board's dream is your work, mm. isn't it? Because it does make the place seem so hospitable. I mean, Glasgow yeah. is hospitable, you know, but it does, and historically it's had such a bad rap. It's a poor city, it's mm. um, a violent city. You know, people hear these kind of shock things about Glasgow and that's the perception that carries forward. And yet here we are looking at it and I don't mean you gentrify it, but and nor do you necessarily beautify it, but you do make it, again, this idea of like yielding, hospitable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, the whole violent city things, uh, well, I, I, don't, I don't see that. Um, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's come on leaps and bounds uh, physically and in terms of violence. You go to any big city in the world, you're going to get violence, but it still holds on to this, particularly down south. To be fair, like the the south of Birmingham has still got that kind of impression. My my wife's from London or Essex. So she she quickly realized, you no, know, it's nothing like that at all. I mean, if you want into certain areas, yeah, you'd be kind of off your head. But again, you do it in Newcastle or Manchester or whatever. Um it's it's much the same. I have to um, say, whenever I'm home in Glasgow, I feel so safe. Yeah, I don't. I don't mean to make light of things. There are obviously dreadful things mm. do happen in Glasgow, sure. and obviously also the areas that I would go to are not those hotspot areas anyway. I grew up in the West yeah. End. Yeah, you know where I grew up, and so ah. these kinds of scenes, much as they are usually teeming, not in these most recent times, but they are usually teeming with people. Those people are usually very friendly, very yeah. warm and open. I always find that sometimes there's a bit of a disconnect between what I know of my home mm -hmm. and what other people tell me. Here in Bournemouth, you know, I feel a lot less safe yeah. than I do. You know, Bournemouth is like a seaside town. Yeah, I've been a few times, I. But, you know, I, I feel so, um, maybe it's also familiarity breeds kind of complacency or something, I don't know, but... Mm -hmm. Again, coming back to looking at your work uh, with somewhere like Ashton Lane, you know, you could never imagine something bad happening in any of these places. Could you? You know, mm -hmm. like, if we look at your work, what bad thing, you know, apart from <laughs> criminal activity of putting a cone yeah. on Wellington's head, nothing... It, um, I want to ask you this, and I don't want you to in any way be offended by it, but do you think that you can infantilise the city at all? 
Do you? Um, I'd never thought about it that way. Um, no, I just draw, basically draw the city as I see it. Um, it's playful. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, people will say, I think my pal um, described my work as not, uh, it's like a caricature of the city, you know, and it's like, yeah, I kind of get that, you know, it's not a cartoon, but more of a kind of a, a take on it. Um, you definitely know it's Glasgow, but it's slightly off kilter, but it's not dry and it's not exacting, you know. I don't know. Um, it's probably it's probably cleaner as it's probably cleaner as well in some sense. I'm not saying Glasgow's not clean um, because it is compared to when I was growing up in the eighties. Mm. But um, whenever I'd, again go back to the to the Herald's illustrations, quite often I'd paint a shop front and it wouldn't be as bonny as it was when I painted it. I don't mean that in a big headed way. I just mean that like the colour might have faded a wee bit in the original wall. And some people have literally said to me, could you touch that? Could you paint that bit black? Because we're going to have that black in two months. That's no problem. So when a paint, it's, it's, it's very vibrant. So it's very sort of crisp and clean, I guess, is maybe what I'm trying to say. And, you know, you don't want to use muddy colour. Well, a lot of people do use muddy colours when they're painting cities, but I like it to be quite vibrant. And the blue skies is, all joking aside, it's actually pretty tasty today in terms of weather. But the blue skies, I think, help sell Glasgow because I was I always paint Glasgow a blue sky but even when you don't have <laughs> colour like now well yeah in fact I think you've got a kind of clip of that uh, a slide of that sometimes we'll drop in colour from Photoshop um, it just gives a different kind of different feel for the illustration I mean this illustration in front of us just now that's painted so that's why the this kind of thing works really well in a, a big vinyl on a wall. In fact, that is in in half tone behind the, the section of porcelain also in Glasgow, and it looks it's really effective because it's not on your face, but the line's nice and thick. So you showed a, a skyline a minute ago. It's pretty much the same skyline, I think. Um, yeah, it's not much, not far removed from that. It's a different, pretty much the same buildings but it's quite a different take on it when you actually see it like that. Mm. And there's a colour version as well that I just drop colour in from Photoshop. So, um, yeah, again, it goes back to my graphic design sort of um, training, I think, in, in using the computer. Most of my stuff's hand-rendered, but occasionally I will take a, a piece like that, put it onto Photoshop and drop in the, the block colour. I mean, Glasgow aside, what, where is your favourite city? That's like asking my, my wife the same thing when she flew. And I think it's a, uh, her answer is the same as mine. Uh, my answer is probably taken from what she said. It, it, it depends what you're looking for, because you could be looking for a, you know, a San Francisco or a Kuala Lumpur, quite different things to compare, you know. But um, I mean, I do like San Francisco. Um, I love London. People say they don't like big cities, and I wouldn't say they're wrong, but I find it difficult to say you don't like a big city because there's so much to get from a big city, whether it's Chicago, New York, Paris, or London. They're all great. And New York, I've been to probably more than any of them, maybe not London, but New York's a funny one with me because, yes, yeah, it's, it's um, a lot of it's to do with the people. Um, and I find uh, cities like Glasgow, Manchester, or let me think of uh, Lisbon, places like that, they're smaller, so they, they are a bit more, um, you can define the people a bit better, you know? And I'm not, I'm, and I'm talking about people from all over the world coming in to cities. I think that's important as well. I mean, if you go to Chicago, you probably meet a lot more Chicagoans than if you go to New York. But you scratch a wee bit and you've got you've got a bit of everything, everyone coming in and everything. And that's one of the reasons Glasgow's helped to evolve and reinvent itself all the time. Because after the ship, shipyards or, or whatever closed down and in certain industries, the steel industries and whatever, there's other people coming into the city over the years, over the decades and centuries that give something more to it. Um, and, and the arts has always been evolving the city. So in terms of the favourite places... You said right at the first she, she can, about this idea sorry. that you constantly have to revise and review your maps because things are constantly evolving yeah. within a cityscape, aren't they? 
Aye, but the, the reasonably accurate map, um, doing those pieces, they, the, I mean, I painted that, uh, the first uh, reasonably accurate map, I did that about, I think it was about 10 years ago. So it's interesting to look at it and see what's changed. I did, there was a large uh, panoramic piece I did for Glasgow Airport years ago, and it was basically from Charing Cross all the way down Sucky Hall Street to more or less the McCann Gallery, so about a mile. And um, if you look at it now, the amount of buildings that have, the shops that have changed and even some buildings that have come down, it's just it's incredible. And that was about it was a good few years ago I did it now, but for such a, a well-known street in Scotland, Sucky Hall Street, it's changed immensely, you know. Fortunately, there's a lot of the buildings still there, but a couple of classics have sadly been pulled down or burnt down. Talking of which, here's classic Glasgow mm. shipyards. Um, I mean, I, as I say, I cycle along the Clyde on both sides. It's fascinating, just the, the dry docks. There's three, there's three big uh, cruise liners sitting in one of the docks at Brayhead just now, which is really unusual to see. Mm. But um, I think the it was uh, Spielberg used this area for... Um, was it 1942, the movie? I can't remember what it was called, the, the World War II movie. And you can see it was, he wouldn't have had to do much to it at all because it's fairly untouched in about 30, 40 years. I know the war was far before then, but you can see the sort of decay and the, the grittiness of that part. And it's, I don't know, it's quite interesting to see. It'd be lovely to see that built on and gentrified. I don't like that word either, but you know what I mean? Made, made look better, but in some ways you can, it's nice to hold on to the mm. fact that that's not changed. There's a couple of, um, you know, the big gas cylinders you used to get um, to hold the gas in, basically. Um, they, there's, there's still you four of them. Your life, so. That's right, uh, there's two just over there at Temple, and there's two up near my grand lived in Ridry. Apparently they're the two biggest in Britain. But they've been listed and it's great because it's just a fascinating structure. No one, no one's really interested in them, but I'm fascinated by them. I think they're beautiful looking things. Um, and it was an important part of big cities. You had them in London, obviously, in Newcastle, Manchester, Birmingham, where you held all the gas originally to light the, the gas lamps for the street and then then as a backup for gas if there was like a problem with people's houses. And, it's, and that was only, I think it was 19. 1980 or something they stopped using them properly that's not a long time ago so my point is sometimes it's nice to see parts of your your own city untouched and showing a bit of the old even if it look, might look a wee bit grubby to certain people we've kind of touched on this already when you're drawing things that are working and so-called alive now is there an element of you recording for the future yeah definitely i mean uh I've got loads of books um, of old Glasgow and I'm constantly reading them. If we go on holiday, that's what we'll be doing. I mean, Dawn and my wife will say, have you not read that book? And I say, yeah, I've, I've actually probably read it about 10 times. I'm probably just not very good at remembering things. But yeah, really important, especially with um, certain cafes or restaurants or, or, or buildings. I mean, there's a, there's a the Titan Crane. You know, that's not a Titan crane, that's the one at the Finiston crane, but the Barclay Curl crane down at Scotston, that's listed, but it's looking a bit shifty, so you get the impression that I might be coming down one day, so whether it be a photograph or a painting of it, it's really important to, to get it uh, chronicled, if you like. I mean, the book I've got just now is Old, old Buildings of Glasgow, and it's great to see it. It's mostly mostly industry buildings, to be fair, but some of them are stunning. Bakeries, beautiful looking. Um, Even when and I just find like, you know, yeah, it's something that I mean, some of these places have been around for quite a while, but not in the larger scheme of things, really. And there's no reason no. why, especially now, like, are these places going to still be there? Are they going to survive? You know, are you feeling a lot of the things you you draw may be fundamentally altered by the pandemic, I suppose. Lots of things just won't be there when you go back out. Yeah, I think we were having this discussion with my friends uh, recently, and especially with restaurants and bars. And yeah, I think some businesses will fold, but on the general, on the whole, I think you'd like to think they'll open up again. Um, 
it'd be interesting to see. I, I wouldn't be surprised if the majority of restaurants and bars in the city or the West End or in the city in general, it's outside, do open up again. But yeah, it's un, we've not been un, uncharted waters, if you like, so it's hard to say. But the, the Ashton Lane image here, I mean, you'll recognise as well that back in the day that was called the cul-de-sac or back in the day that was the Grosvenor Cafe. The amount of conversations you have with your pals about, what was the name of that club back in 82? Mm -hmm. And you can go on forever about that. So as long as I'm, places... I'm still not over the fact that every time I go to the bottom of Buyer's Road, the volcano's not there anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's like right. some giant student accommodation there. But Yeah, uh, it's, it's not the Bonnie building. It's all right, but it was, a, it was certainly an interesting club, yeah. <laughs> I think it is something also, I mean, I am one of those, I said, no, well, not quite an expat. Obviously I'm still in the UK, but I don't live in the place that I would still and always call home. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm, I am astonished. I forget what Glasgow looks like up to a point. And when I return, how different the urban landscape is each time I go back. And so- yeah, I, uh... Yeah, the building, the, the amount of building work going on just now is incredible and it's great to see. I mean, a lot of it's uh, uh, accommodation, but it's, 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 it's usually building onto uh, uh, sites that have been disused and lying empty and looking ugly. You know, going back to what I was saying a, a wee while ago, but it's nice to see a bit of that. You don't want to... Oh, you've gone, Adrian. Oh. I had great oh, there. Oh, there I'm back. <laughs> I'm back, yeah. You're back. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's always encouraging to see building working on in a city. It just suggests there's a bit of uh, life and there's, uh, the economy is working. And yeah, I mean, here's a here's unique cafe. I mean, the amount of classic cafes that have shut down over the years are, you know, sometimes the board, they, they cover over the sign. That's not the end of the world because, you know, you could pull that back off and the sign will be there. But yeah, there's, there's fewer and fewer of these cafes left and they're just the classic i mean that the university part of childhood as well I have yeah, to say. i mean you go yeah you get back in there sandy you'll just be like you haven't left it's not changed really a bit they're, you know they've, i think they've, i think they might have a, a toilet you don't need to get a key for and to go around into the other coast now but they've still got the skinny little tables and they still serve you know everything goes in there you i used to go in there with grace my daughter before we'd go to one of our dance classes and and you'd see like uh, the students, a uh, real old man, a real old woman, the mints and tatties, and the mums and dads, and the student, uh, the, the There'd school always kids. be a granny. There'd always be a granny with like a 10p who'd come up. To totally. Oh, myself a sweetie, you know, something. <laughs> Stay in the pram, aye. Uh, so it's changed, I think it changed hands a couple of years ago, but that, that's um, 101 years old now, I think, the Uni Cafe. I think it was yeah. uh, 1919. Yeah. 102 years old so yeah it's, it's still great and it's there used to be a couple of uh, two or three ice cream shops further up the road there was an Ardini's and there was a Crowlas and something else they've all shut university's still going strong so they must have something about them you know but to, painting shop fronts like that I'd do that all day long I'd love it you know there's so much so much interest in the Again, they're, they're old, they're old buildings. They're and that's old. Well, I always find it fascinating that they are of a time, but they're also timeless when you do them. Yeah. You know. All right, thanks, yeah. You know. Um, but they, uh, to me, they paint themselves because they're just, they're so beautiful, you know. Mm. I mean, the, the words, uh, the lettering rather, is just classic, you know. Um, the teas, coffees, ices, that kind of thing. It's ices. It's, no one says that. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone accepts it, you know. They don't have mince and tatties there, to be fair. Is this one of those places where you've been the scary man at the window? I can't remember if they've always... Did they not used to have, like, glitter, foil? Yeah, they have still got that. So photographing one of them, that's fine. You can you can go right up to the window because basically you're not, you can't see inside. Apart from the door, you can see inside the door, but I clearly didn't. I wasn't scary man at the door. Because I didn't paint the inside there. That was that's quite an older painting. Now, now I'd go right up to the door and you'd be able to see a wee bit inside. This used to hang in my dining room when I was growing up. Where is it now? Your mum's your dad's? Mum's, I think. Canada? She's yeah. still in Canada? Yeah, I Same think... I can't, do you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's really... It's, yeah, it's, it's very... 
popular one. It's the most popular. I've got another company called uh, Dead Famous Cities, and we print onto tea towels and aprons and posters, and that outsells. We do all the cafe ones with that flies out the door that always outsells any other cafe in but it's because you know there's nobody i know who grew up in the west end of glasgow who didn't go and get their ice cream yeah absolutely and they still are which is great to see oh there's great again it's my batteries running low <laughs> well we are nearly at the end but i do just have one other question that i, I did want to ask and i haven't managed to insert it anywhere yet We've heard about you being really, really interested in the kind of historical context of Glasgow and, and being interested in old buildings as much as new buildings and your, your feelings about kind of recording for posterity, for, for kind of future casting, for the idea of looking back and being nostalgic. But in terms of other artists, and I think my students will find this of real value, who would you say has really inspired you as an artist? Uh, Ralph Steadman probably, who did the illustrations for Fear and Loathing, and he also did all the odd bins, paint, windows paintings as well. He used to do a lot of um, political cartooning. He said he stopped doing political cartoons years ago, but he still uh, dips his toe in. I mean, he, I've, met him, I've met him once years ago, a uh, thoroughly interesting, funny guy. Again, works like um, Quentin Blake. Not dissimilar in a way, his stuff's a bit more... Um, it's less loose, if you like. Uh, there's more lines to it and a lot more kind of, I was going to say violence. It's not violence, but there's a lot more splatter to it. Um, and his, his, his um, I mean, he can illustrate or draw anything. I don't like to call him an illustrator. He's, it, he seems to sort of cheapen him somehow. He's a wonderful artist, but his architectural pieces are stunning. You know, I've got a couple of his prints that I bought. He did a whiskey distillery series and uh, just again what you're saying about my work I say about his work it really draws you in mm. and you feel like you're there um, and again he'll use different techniques for the sky that we use for the the buildings to differentiate between the two so let's say across the team Ralph Devon and there's a lesser known guy American guy from about 110 15 years ago who used to illustrate all the buildings all the skyscrapers in New York and Chicago and Boston before they were built so it was in Artist impression. He was called a uh, Hewson Holly. So Hugh Son Holly. Um, if you can see, if I look up his work, you might you probably understand why. Cross between Ralph Steadman and Hewson Holly's, because his I've got a lot of uh, kind of light within them, a bit more structured, but then um, again a kind of nice rich feel to them. So they're the two that I would say because I mean Ralph Steadman paints everything and anything, but um, his architectural pieces I love and. Houston Holly was an architectural renderer. So yeah, those two. Have you got a particular building or a particular storefront or cafe that you haven't actually yet painted, but that you know you must? Uh, yeah, there's probably a few a list. Uh, as mentioned earlier on, people said to me, I'm trying to think off the top of my head though, of an actual an actual building. And I can't. <laughs> what was there was the one recently? I can't believe I've not painted it, but it's not coming to me, I'm afraid. It's okay. I mean, I'm sure that there are cafe, restaurant and bar owners all over Glasgow who are very hopeful that you immortalise. Well, yeah, I did. Uh, when I stopped, uh, I stopped uh, doing the restaurant reviews in 2011, but Joanna Blyden, the restaurant reviewer, she kept writing them. And so a couple of restaurants got good reviews, but they were disappointed they didn't have there wasn't an illustration by myself, so they subsequently commissioned me to do a painting, which is a lovely compliment. Um, but what I always say to them is, uh, where are you going to hang this um, painting of your restaurant? And when they say in the restaurant, that's, that's what you want to hear. When they say they're taking it home, it's like, I'm not interested. I want people to see it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're you such a diva. There's a bit of ego involved, obviously, you know. <laughs> Well, Adrian, you really are the Glasgow illustrator. And um, thank you for spending the time talking to me today about your work. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. No, thanks. Thank you, Sandy. It's great to speak to you again. And uh, I thought your questions were terrific. So it was, uh, I always find a wee bit about myself when I'm asked these questions. So uh, thanks very much. Um, pleasure. Thanks, Adrian. Bye. Bye.